From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on the SOR Newswire put together by Captain Shirk and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by the Mighty Moose Beard Oil Company. It's 100% Canadian, 100% natural, taking care of beards around the world. Visit MightyMooseBeard.com. Use promo code SOR2019 today. Around these parts, we love to call our guest tonight the Queen of Cryptids. And any time we get a chance to talk with author, investigator, and artist Linda Godfrey, we are better off for it. Linda is the author of 18 books on strange creatures, phenomena, and people, including her latest, I Know What I Saw. Linda unceremoniously hopped into the cryptid world after breaking the story of the Beast of Bray Road back in the late 1980s. Since then, she has been a fixture on television shows, documentaries, and numerous radio programs. Her website is lindagodfrey.com, then at the bottom of our Hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. It's been a few months, but we're always glad to have Linda Godfrey on the show, the queen of cryptids. How have you been? Very well. And and you, Dave, I hope you're also well. I am doing very well as well. Thank you so much. Linda, it has been a whirlwind the last 31 years for you, ever since the Beast of Bray Road, and you broke that story at your local newspaper. I want to go back in time over the last 31 years, not to age any of us, but just the fact that when you started your journalism career and you were one of the only real journalists that is covering anything in this field, did you ever think that, a monster sighting would define your career. Absolutely not. <laughs> it was truly the farthest thing from my mind. You know, I, it just never occurred to me that anything like that would happen. And, I mean, I'd had a few incidents in my life. My family lived in a 100-year-old house that was definitely haunted when I was a kid for a while. And I was used to the old, you know, ghost walking up the stairs at night and I had a picture that, on my wall that breathed, made loud breathing sounds, unless I said the Lord's Prayer. So it wasn't that I never had any ex- experience with strange things. It's just that um, in this day and age, you don't hear people talking about werewolves. And I did not think that it was a werewolf actually back then, and I still don't think that it was a regular um, Hollywood style or even medieval French style of werewolf where you've got Lon Chaney sprouting whiskers and his teeth are lengthening and his very DNA is morphing and twisting until his entire body is completely changed from every corpuscle of a human to every corpuscle of a wolf. You, you know, that that's just not what I think is going on or has been in any case. But I certainly didn't think that back in, uh, it was New Year's Eve weekend of uh, 91 into 92 when this was published. And my editor and I at the time thought that it was just going to be, you know, produce some local fun. It was kind of a dead news time around the county. And he said, well, you know, we'll put it in the paper and people will have a chuckle and then they'll forget about it. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, We put it in the paper and published it a lot. I think my other big news story in that particular issue was about this kindly couple that went to area nursing homes and played the piano for the residents <laughs> so and, and i had some cartoons in there too i did a comic strip and, and editorial cartoons i was sort of the uh jill of all trades there but what happened was people started calling and writing and they didn't have the internet like we do now you know they had to write snail mail and find the newspapers actually actual phone number and call me on phones that had curly uh, cords sticking to them. And even given those primitive conditions, um, I was hearing from just dozens of people saying, I saw this thing, you know, I had an experience, my uncle saw it, 
Um, they were coming from other states, other countries, even the Virgin Islands. And I started thinking to myself, hmm, there might be a little bit more to this than just some sick and dangerous animal or um, a, a campfire story in the making. And I started, I, I realized quickly, I kind of looked around for other people who were writing about this sort of thing, and there really weren't any. There were Bigfoot story books and things like that out here and there, but not like we have now. And so I felt like, well, people are taking the time to write and call me and entrust me with their experiences, and I don't know what they are or what they mean, but it felt like it felt to me like I had somehow been dubbed keeper of this of the lore. That's how I thought of myself. It's just sort of um, keeping all these things. And every once in a while, during the ten subsequent years that I worked at that newspaper, um, I wrote maybe tops three or four um, sort of brief updates when I would get a pile of things. You know, I'd make an update page, and, and they were always very well received. And I finally, after ten years, started thinking, well, People are still so interested, and move, uh, not just movie movie um, producers, but TV producers of, from various places had started coming out and recording me on shows. And I thought, well, maybe if I just put it all in a book, and everybody knows how it happened and what happened and what I've learned since then, that that'll be good for posterity, and I can go on to other things. Well, that didn't work out in that way exactly. Um, I found a publisher right away. I had another book. My my first book was actually a true historic local crime called The Poison Widow, a true story of sin, strychnine, and murder, which was actually very shocking and probably more horrific than anything I've ever reported, any of the creatures that people write about doing in any of my books. It was a a woman who murdered her husband, she and her and her a much younger lover murdered her husband with strychnine, which is a horrible death. You know, it's like if you've ever had a Charlie horse, imagine the worst Charlie horse ever in your whole body at once, and it goes on and on. And they, um, she would have gotten away with it, except she tried to kill her four children in the same way. And it just went out. Well, that was my first book. And then the publisher asked, well, have you got anything else? And I said, well... Um, what do you think about werewolves? And, of course, I, w- I use the term loosely because it puts an instant picture in people's minds. That's what people are describing. They look like something with a uh, German shepherd or wolf head, pointy ears on top of their head, long muzzles with the big dripping canines. Um, they have long ta- bushy tails like a wolf, if you see them most of the time. Sometimes there's a little bit more dogness to them, but that's the general Description and they walk on their toe pads, only their hind toe pads. Um, although they can also drop down to all fours just as easily and and uh, run or, or walk easily either way. So um, when I explained it, and my my idea was not just to tell a bunch of scary stories. Um, what I wanted to do was kind of make the setting understood for people and describe what the little town of Elkhorn was like and the effect that this had on the people in the town and what the town did and then um, about the next um, pile of of, uh, reports that came in to me and what I did with those and what people were saying and just my general ideas. And it just took off from there. I got to ask you, in the days without the Internet, trying to find information about the Beast of Bray Road, which put you on the map, and all of a sudden, just because you wrote one story, everybody is expecting you the unfortunate task of being the expert on it, which was highly unfair at that time. I'm just wondering, in regards to to everything that kind of went on there, how did you find information without the use of the Internet because this was such an obscure topic? Well, you know, a lot of it came directly to me, um, just from the first article and the first book. Um, but there were, there were lots of in-person um, interviews that I did right around the area, and one seemed to lead to another. For instance, our county animal control officer, um, he was the one that I had asked him if, 
if uh, he had heard anything about this thing that people were calling a werewolf on Bray Road. And it turned out he had the manila file folder full of all the contact names. So I just started by calling those people, and then they set me off to other people. And um, when when the book ran, I, I got letters and phone calls from people in Michigan. There was a guy in Michigan who said, hey, we got that same thing here, um, 19, 1987. Um, this thing is supposed to come out on the seventh year of every decade. It's called the Michigan Dog Man. And so there was another whole state that still is actually a, a pretty good repository of, of reports. So a lot of it just started, it was like, you know, the spotlight had shined on one place and all things were coming to me that way. Now, there are also, um, if you go back some, a couple hundred years, there are some very good, much, much older books on the uh, the European werewolves and other wolf-like creatures that ran on their hind legs. And I soon noticed that there was a big difference between those and the ones that people were reporting to me, which was mostly the fact that um, back in the olden days, they were really killing people and eating people. Um, I think one one was uh, tasked with uh, or uh, accused of eating at least 100 people, killing, uh, if, he, if he didn't eat them all, 100 people. And I've only had one fairly minor injury reported to me in all the years that I've been following this. So, so there was a difference there, but there was lots of old information, and, and I found it fascinating. I started digging into local Native American um, beliefs. We have a great historical state historical society that had a project where they uh, sent people to interview Native Americans and catch a lot of the um, the lore before it was all gone. So that was a very rich place to mine, and I would um, seek these people out and as well and try and talk to their tribal chair people. Uh, that was very rewarding. So it was just a and, – and I actually, during those 10 years of the newspaper, had really kind of honed any investigative skills I had and realized that I, I liked just looking for things from nothing. For instance, there was a pilot ejection seat – found in Lauderdale Lake, which was real close to where I lived at the time. Um, it was found in about, let's see, it would have been 1998, something like that. Um, one of these these weed remover barge things was trolling around the lake, just trying to clean up uh, the seaweed. And uh, they happened to dredge up this pilot ejection seat from a World War II flyer. As far as anybody knew, there were no World War II battles in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. So uh, there were some uh, just legible um, numbers on it, serial numbers on it. And I was able from those serial numbers and some other info about the the plane able to figure out what happened and found the, the name of the pilot who was piloting the plane. And evidently he was flying over, had some trouble, ejected and of course the ejection seat falls away and then he parachuted down into a field and walked to a farmhouse and uh, got back to I think it was Chicago where he was from and I really enjoyed tracking that down and I thought wow if I could do this sort of thing with these creatures you know fun for me it would be interesting and maybe I'd learn something and figure out what they were so that was what set me down the investigative path that's still a tough, tough push because that's a lot of hours going into that, a lot of journalistic hours. Now, it's not impossible, as you have shown, but you must have been sitting at your desk literally three, four hours of overtime a night looking into this. Well, I was. You know, it was just fascinating to me. And the, if you remember, I also had that other book. I was, I actually researched that book for about six years on the Poison Widow, I had five or five to six hundred pages of court documents. I had letters that she and her lover wrote to one another. Um, I found myself in February s- scraping um, ice off of a tombstone in a, this little house on, or little, excuse me, cemetery on a hill, um, trying to find out a date so I could 
figure out some obscure fact about what the husband's brother was doing, which seemed to have some bearing on the case. So I was already, I was doing that at the same time too. I was just spending a lot of my time researching. And then that just kept up um, after uh, those first couple of books came out. And I had a website at the same time too. I, I had to quit, quit the newspaper and a friend and, and I started up a, we were way ahead of our time. It was uh, called CNBC, and it was supposed to be an online community, and we were going to do um, just pages for people that didn't have any Internet uh, know-how or, or desire to, to know how, how they went. And we were looking up a little quirky topics. So I had that and these books, and then um, it was a very big break when the Barnes & Noble uh, Weird Series editors asked me to be one of the writers for those Weird Series books. I got to co- co-write co um, Weird Wisconsin, and then I authored uh, Weird Michigan. And again, that was nothing but looking up ob- obscure things. So I, I had a lot of it, and I've always enjoyed that. It makes it much more interesting, especially if I can find a connection or something new that nobody knew about um, any of these topics. And sometimes those topics would segue into other ones. I'd, I'd learn new things just while um, th- there, there was a – Sid Harris was the name of a really fa- – a very famous um, writer, newspaper writer. And every once in a while he had a column that was titled, Things I Found While On My Way to Looking Up Something Else. Those were always to me his best columns because they were things he would never rather think think about um, if it hadn't been for looking up another particular thing. So um, to me, I, I just was enjoying it. I was in bliss. Linda Godfrey is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I Know What I Saw, her latest book, which can be found in all major bookstores. And we're going to get into that book in the next half hour, Linda. But I do want to ask you in regards to journalism, because journalism in the paranormal has always been taken with a grain of salt. There's a lot of people who claim they're journalists but have never been a journalist. There's a lot of people who are writing blogs and vlogs and everything that is going on in between. But very few trained, qualified journalists have ever taken on this field as seriously as you have. You know, I think of George Knapp. I think of Leslie Kane. I think of... You know, Ralph Blumenthal, just to name a few. But for the most part, the media has always kind of frowned about giving these types of stories any attention. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to kind of look at that idea that journalists should be taking this story and these stories much more seriously than what they have in the past. Well, I, I do want to make it very clear that I don't, I ne- I never had a degree in journalism. My degree is in art education and I just received that job sort of by default. I happened to be talking to the editor about the editorial cartoon I was going to do. And, um, about 10 minutes earlier, their um, main reporter had quit, and he said, hey, we have an opening. Would you like to be a reporter? So that was how I got to be a newspaper journalist. But I will say, in, in my own self-defense, that I was very serious. I'd, I'd always been a writer, um, not published much or anything, but um, I knew I could write to a certain extent and that I could learn and we had very good people. This was not, I've seen the place described someplace as a, like a shopper magazine where it's just, you know, you're selling, you're telling about your rummage sale or whatever. And this was actually quite a good feature story paper. We, we won lots of national awards. And um, the editors were people with uh, degrees, advanced degrees in journalism and uh You know, it was a great place for me to learn my trade. It was more like a prolonged internship than anything else. And I I did take it seriously. And it I thought that if you're gonna take the trouble to write about these unknown creatures, um, first of all, I'd learned already that it's really better to treat 
um, somebody who comes to you with the story, seriously take them at their word, uh, check and verify. Trust but verify. Um, who's, whose line was that? One of the presidents. I can't remember which one. But that was kind of my own uh, credo as well. Um, I would trust that these people were going to tell me the truth, but then I would also go and research whatever they told me. And, you know, if there were too many facts that didn't fit, you know, if they said this was in front of a, a church with an angel on 7th Street, and I'd go to 7th Street, and you can use um, you can use Google Maps to go up and down and look, and there was no church with an angel in front, well, I'd start questioning their story. So, and the, and the better, the more comprehensive um, all the searches became, the, the search engines became, the easier it was to check that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as having some integrity as a journalist, to me, that's just part of having integrity as a person. You know, if you want people to um, be interested in your stories, they, they have to believe that you have some credibility, that you have um, some skill that you will always apply and that you'll take their story seriously as, as much as you can, or it's just not worth it. Um, if people know that you you joke your way through something and they can never tell which is right and which, which is meaningful and which isn't, um, they're going to get bored with your writing, and, and they should. Um, it's it's not worth reading something like that, unless it's obvious, like The Onion, of course. I don't know if The Onion, um, which is a, a humor newspaper that I think went out of business a few years ago, but was very, very funny. Um, I don't know if they ever had a, a werewolf or a beast of Bray Road story in the onion, they probably did. I can't imagine that they wouldn't have. But other, you know, outside of intentional humorous projects, um, I I think people deserve to have their stories treated seriously. I agree with that too. And and you know, there are so many experiencers out there. And it's funny because last night we did a show about critical thinking when it comes to the paranormal. What is evidence? what is not. But the one thing we can't take away from that critical thinking is these experiences that people are having are happening to everyday people. It doesn't matter if they're a doctor, a lawyer, a gas station attendant, or a bartender. It really doesn't matter. These things are happening. And when it happens, it can be very traumatic for people, maybe not in an in a physical way, but definitely in an emotional way, because they're stuck trying to figure out what happened to them. And Linda, I'm going to get you to hold on here because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Linda Godfrey is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. More with the Queen of Cryptids right after this. Hey, Spaced Out Radio listeners, it's Dave Scott. I want you to check out a great documentary I'm involved in called Beyond the Spectrum, Mossan's UFO Files. Directed by Darcy Weir, the film follows Jaime Mossan's journey for mainstream journalistic truth in ufology in Mexico. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon Prime. If you're a member, watch it free. It's worth the watch. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. 
looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacey, head of the research association, TESSA. Soon on the Space Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Space Out Radio listeners today. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Coming up this September 21st and 22nd, all UFO eyes will be focused on Toronto for the 4th Annual Alien Cosmic Expo. Come listen to some of the biggest names and experiencers in ufology. Travis Walton, Paul Hellyer, Richard Dolan, Paula Harris, Grant Cameron, Randy Kramer, and Spaced Out Radio's own Dave Scott. Tickets are on sale now at aliencosmicexpo.com.
Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters, hair pulled back but still looking styling and profiling. Hey, I want to remind everybody that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can always check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. And of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and much more. Tonight, we talk with the queen of cryptids. Linda Godfrey, her website, lindagodfrey.com, her latest book, I Know What I Saw, is one of the best out there, and it get, is getting amazing reviews. Linda, thank you so much. Before we get started, i got to give you a big uh, round of applause. I'm actually clapping here for you, if you can hear me, because you, yeah. you were actually a little bit shocked and stunned that the Wall Street Journal really praised your book. Let us know about that. Yeah, I didn't even know about it until like the day before it was going to appear. You know, so I was still, I thought it probably would be weeks or months, and then there it was, and it was a color half page, top of the page, which is just prime, you know, if you come from a newspaper background. Um, I was really shocked more for the fact that they had, chosen to review something in the cryptozoology field than I was, you know, I, I mean, I don't think I'm a great writer, but I guess I thought with the, anybody feels that you have a good subject and you treat it well, you can, you know, do well with reviews. And I just have really gotten so little respect over the years from mainstream, uh, mainstream press in, in most cases, unless they're devoted to doing that kind of book, like the Barnes & Noble series, that I didn't expect the Wall Street Journal would uh, review a cryptozoology story. And then when I heard it, I was a little worried. I thought, oh, you know, maybe they put it in just so they could have something to laugh at, because that happens from time to time. And no, they did a really imaginative, in fact, I gave a a shout-out to the the writer of, of the review for starting for doing his own work. And right in the very beginning, he was telling something that was not exactly in my book but was related, which is um, a new type of hybrid, believe it or not, of fox and cat. And it's a predator. And I'm quite sure, I mean, foxes aren't even supposed to be, be able to breed with dogs or other canines. They're kind of a different um a different category all to their own. And here they're reporting a fox cat, and there were uh, there was sort of a weird, I think that was a photo of it, I'm not sure. might have just been a representation. But um, that was pretty exciting to me and hadn't been information that was available when I wrote the book. I started it three years ago. It was a long, long labor of love um, to finish it. But... Yeah, I thought, well, that's that's really great because he is in the spirit. He's not just going through, you know, some of the things I've told him about. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go out and find something um, interesting to write about. And I thought it made the review even better because it, it, it showed it was he was really into the spirit of the subject. And that's what took so long um, from the time of the first uh, headlines breaking was for anybody to really give that topic any sort of respect you know bigfoot researchers were saying it was impossible and they invented something called um the snout nosed bigfoot to explain the dog man which i thought was a pretty big stretch and i i I still do almost all bigfoots that are cited are described as having uh, a wide but flattened nose you know they don't have like a dog muzzle and Moreover, they don't walk the same way. Bigfoots clearly walk on flat feet called plantigrade, and the canines clearly walk on their toe pads, which is a diff- leaves an entirely different um, print. You, you would never mistake a Bigfoot print for a, a wolf-like print and in, in vice versa. So um, having had all that going on, it's, it's just so nice to get some um, willingness to talk about not only that creature. This book has a lot of different things in it. I was trying to focus, um, in in the case of the uh, upright canines, 
on ones that had particular legends with them, uh, trying to sort out myth and legend and real contemporary sightings and, and see if there were connections. So um, I, I was doing something a little differently than other people. Boy, could you just hear that big peal of thunder? I did. I, I thought you maybe hit your <laughs> desk or something. No, there's there's a, a big thunder and lightning storm going on. So if you hear rumbling, it's it's pretty close by, just to let you know. But anyway, so that that I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I I, I want to I, I, I want to ask you this though. Sorry for cutting you off there. Sure, no problem. Do 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 you think that maybe because of what's happening in ufology today, that maybe some of these you know critics and and writers are now looking into other subjects because maybe there is something to this. And do you think that maybe that's the reason why your book was chosen? It's possible um, because I do have a chapter on uh, UFOs and kind of relating um, werewolf type animals sightings to um, European military installations and well, and American ones too, but. Um, I, I keep finding more and more from Europe, and you, you're going, and you're also finding UFOs. And uh, there's another one that has um, a grave of a purported vampire. So it's kind of like John Keel's window opening all over again. Uh, things coming from another dimension or spirit world, whatever, whatever you want to call it, but a different place than here. Right, right. Now, when we get into, I know what I saw. This is a book that is getting a lot of rave reviews, as I know in this field, most of your books do, if not all of them. What sets this one different from anything else you've written? Well, I'd say that this one is more, um, oh, let's see, more, it's more goal-oriented in that I was sort of tasked by my publisher to write uh, what they wanted was a book about these creatures and how the creatures related to ancient myth and then if there was any relationship to things like Slender Man, Killer Clowns, what's called the new urban legend. Because we've had urban legends around forever, you know, the, the classic boy and girl necking in the car and there's a big noise and there's a monster face at the window and the boy gets out and he's found torn apart and stuffed in the tree you know later and the girl has to escape running home in fact there's a good example of one of those in my chapter titled um, uh, a, a dog woman and a meat hook <laughs> which is I think oh, my, my favorite chapter, my favorite chapter title ever but um, it's it's just sort of omnipresent in so many of these things and yet um, people keep describing them, and um, many times there are reports where there isn't any sort of a, a trope or theme from legendary that you can see. It's just some people out late at night, and the same sort of thing happens to them. They usually aren't found ripped apart later, but um, they will see an animal looking in the windows or you know, trying to rock the car or the truck full of uh, just cleaned up deer as one incident um, had happened and so you know and why is this why is it that we're still seeing the same creatures that we saw that the Sumerians saw and drew you know like Pazuzu the the huge giant kind of bat like bird was supposed to be sort of an evil god or in the ancient Egyptians um, so many people if they see uh, today if they see a uh, an upright black canine creature, they'll say it reminded them of Anubis, which was the Egyptian uh, god of the dead, and it look, looked like um, it had the head of a jackal and then uh, more of a man-like body. Although in some of the cave paintings and art that are left, um, it's pretty easy to see that it was a priest body wearing a jackal head mask. Um, but not always. Sometimes they're the complete... Uh, jackal creature. Sometimes you can see that there's some of both. Um, they made Egyptians made a lot of art, so we have a lot to pick from. But why is it that we still see these exact same things? And that's and that's the big thing. The people you are interviewing, 
You know, I think the mainstream uh, who doesn't take these subjects very seriously, Linda, they always look at the stereotypes that people who are having these experiences are usually the night shift workers at a convenience store, not very educated, not well dressed, bad dental plan. You know what I'm saying? There is a real stigma that goes around in the mainstream with all of this. So when you are interviewing this, I mean, that, I'm assuming, couldn't be further from the truth from the people who are having these amazing experiences. No, it's really, really true. You know, and I've had somebody ra- uh, raise their hand after giving a talk at a small civic uh, group um, in Wisconsin and say, um, are you sure that a lot of these people who report to you aren't named Bubba? And... Uh, <laughs> I had to I had to chuckle because um, this man had an and had an Italian surname. This is like Laurie and Dreese and Rick Renzulli, who are in the the original first book. And I said, kind of innocently, "Well, um, actually, when I'm thinking about it, a lot of them have Italian names." And then I remembered he had an Italian name, and it kind of brought the house down. Um, that was a probably my, my best laugh ever in a, in a speech. And I wasn't trying to be mean. I, I just sincerely was thinking, hmm, names. And all these Italian names of witnesses came in, flooding into my head. And uh, everybody just thought that was pretty funny. But um, the only person, I, I do also ask people if they were um, drinking at the time or if they did drugs. And um, people will, uh, it's a very high percentage of witnesses who say they don't drink or they used to but they don't now and really only one person ever said to me yeah I was drinking but he added but I sobered up really fast when I saw that thing and I've also I, I'll just say real quick um, you know the other odd thing is if this was the product of drinking then um, why are people not reporting this after they're drunk and I've I've um, been at um, or been giving talks, and I'll ask people, I'll say, raise your hand if you've ever had more than enough to drink. And a lot of people will raise their hand, and then I say, raise your hand if drinking made you see an upright werewolf. And of course, everybody chuckles and nobody raises their hand because it doesn't happen that way. So when you are dealing with these people in this book, and I'm going to read the title because I only read part of it. It's called I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. Who are the people, if you were to describe them, that you interviewed about this? Are they doctors? Are they lawyers? Are they everyday people who are just trying to get by and pay their bills and keep a roof over their head? Maybe describe them. Yeah, I think all of the above, you know, um, from um, I had one active military commander who happens to be um, on assignment right now at the moment. Who uh, his wife wrote me and, and said he he uh, got a copy of the book, but he'll read it when he gets back from his present tour that he's on. Uh, I've had people who are um, younger, maybe, uh, and happen to be having campfires outdoors, non-drinking campfires and seen things moving around in the darkness. I've had uh, mothers, people, a surprising number of people who um, remember back to having their experiences at a young age, quite, a, quite like elementary school age, and it just always stuck with them, and their mother still remembers that they have other collaborators who, re, who uh, also do recall Um it's just a wide variety, um, well-to-do people, um, not well-to-do people, uh, Native Americans, um, you know, it, it's just a, a wide variety. One of the very first witnesses of the Beast of Bray Road uh, back in Elkhorn was a young woman who was um, of African-American origin. So, you know, it's just a very diverse group of people, and that was one thing that caught my attention at the very beginning, that I noticed um, there was no single type. It was just people who happened to be in the right place at the right time. That is true. Is it the right time, though? Um, 
You mean, would they have been better off? For those people, yeah. Would they have been better off without? Some think so. Some think so. Uh, One of my earliest, 1981, was a sighting by um, a man named Marv Kirshnick, very talented um, auto repair specialist and also an artist. And he said he became really troubled by it. He couldn't stop thinking about why he was the one that had seen it and in fact, he um, opened up a little shop and was selling his artwork. He was making um, beaded necklaces and sculptures and fabulous mar- marionettes uh, creatures that were werewolves. He had a giant, uh, a giant uh, full life-sized one hanging in his window, and uh, he actually made like his his basement. He made to look like a cave. Uh, used styrofoam and, and stuff to sort of sculpt the, the cave walls. He lived and he lived in a dome, and eventually, um, you know, he just uh, lost all of that and um, just had a very difficult time. Some people compare it to uh, PTSD. Um, it, you know, not not exactly the same thing as being in a battle, but feeling that you are in Im- imminent peril. And that it hadn't been anything you expected, you know. It, it sticks with people, and they'll they'll say, "Not a day goes by that I don't think about that thing, and wonder why it chose me or why I saw it, um, something like that." That's what I was going to ask you next in regards to the trauma and the stress that people feel with these encounters. How prevalent was that? Um. I'd say probably close to 50%. Some people would be more frightened than others. Um, those who were either had their windows down or who encountered one while they were outside alone had probably more terrifying experience than those who were just riding along in their car and it crossed the road in front of them and they really never felt like they were in any real personal danger. Um, so it's... It, it kind of varies, but these people um, still will sometimes say, I, I kind of wish I'd never seen it, part, partly because they had to endure being called crazy by friends and relatives. That part of it is as much of a stigma and a negative uh, effect of these sightings as the fear of not of, of the creature itself. It's, it's um, being sort of ostracized by your friends and you know, you're afraid people are, especially in a small town, you're afraid people are whispering that you're crazy or, or whatever. Um, you know, that's never enjoyed by anyone. How did this affect their lives on a different level? Now, everybody's going to experience everything different as we got about four and a half minutes here before we go to break at the top of the hour. But how did this affect their lives from previous to the sighting to now? I realize it's a generalized question, Linda, because you interviewed a lot of people about this, but just the general feeling of it all. Yeah, um, I think that many people feel that overall, whether it seemed positive or just sort of negative or even neutral, um, that people feel they've sort of been opened to the fact that there is a spirit world. Uh, for for better or for worse, that there are things out there they didn't realize, that they discovered they didn't know everything like they thought they did. And that is terrifying in some ways, but also very interesting in in others. And um, that's what most of them are grappling with. It's like, um, I wasn't afraid it was going to eat me. It was just that I looked at it, and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't identify it as something of this world. And that's the part that most of them have difficulty with. Right. Have there been people who have completely changed their lives to the fact that maybe they were non-believers beforehand, and now they are researching as much as they can to try and find those answers? Um. Not too many do that intensive amount of research. They'll call me or there are other people now to call, you know, other websites um, and groups and things that um, have taken up an interest in it. And, and I think that's good. I mean, there's no way 
one person, me, could handle every, you know, every report of everybody who's had these experiences. There, there are many. But, um, the, and you thinking about that, I totally lost the thread of what, what was, what were you asking well, me? Just in regards that they have become research hounds themselves, trying yes, to figure um, out what happened to them. Yeah, some have to a certain extent. Most seem to be happy uh, finding out there are others like them and being able to tell their encounter to someone without being made fun of. And for most people, I think that kind of settles it for them in many ways. Not totally, of course, but um, it takes the edge off their um, nervousness about having been a participant in such an encounter. Linda, we got about uh, 90 seconds here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour, and we're talking with Linda Godfrey tonight on Spaced Out Radio. When you talk to these people, and in the next hour, we're going to be getting more specific into stories uh, regarding this. Some of these sightings that people are having are just so unbelievable with these new urban legends, as you mentioned, like Slender Man and many others that are going on. How do you trust these people with these new legends comparatively to those who had a Bigfoot or Dogman or alien experience? Well, there are many fewer of them, as far as I know. And um, it's sort of generally understood by most people that Slender Man is a fabrication made up in an online horror. Horror. (laughs) It's hard to say that word. Um, site where people have an idea there's this um, tall slim evil man that lives in the woods and kind of preys on little children going through the woods Um, that it's not your normal it's not your everyday monster it's something that was made up and then um, people start reacting to it and you're probably familiar with the terrible tragedy where um, a little girl in Waukesha, Wisconsin, was almost yes. stabbed to death, right for the sake of, of Slender Man when it's really something that people right before our eyes have made up over the past several years. That's right. That's right. And it's unfortunate that sometimes, doesn't matter the age, but sometimes people take that a little too seriously because they want to see what the effects are. And that's where we get into things like tulpas and all the sort of weird creatures that maybe we create out of our own minds. And we'll get into that in the next hour, hour number two of Spaced Out Radio, coming up with the Queen of Cryptids, Linda Godfrey, her new book. You can find it in every major bookstore called I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. Make sure you pick it up. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Canada's largest UFO conference is ready to roll in Toronto this September 21st and 22nd at the Alien Cosmic Expo. This year is about the experience. 
listen to the stories of Dave Scott, Travis Walton, Paula Harris, Grant Cameron, Ryan Stacy, Richard Dolan, Leslie Mitchell Clark, and more. Get your tickets now at aliencosmicexpo.com. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Hey fans, it's Dave Scott. Do I have something for you to check out? A great documentary about legendary Mexican investigative journalist Jaime Mossan and his search for the truth about UFOs. Beyond the spectrum, Mossan's UFO files can be found on Amazon Prime. It's free to watch if you're a member. You might even hear me in it. So check out Beyond the Spectrum only on Amazon Prime. Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com.
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook's Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us in. Hi to everyone listening in on KZFX 93.7 FM in Ridgecrest, California, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans, down in Dangerfield, Texas. We're on KDNF AM 1560 and KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon. Hi to everyone listening in on the digital side on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Remember, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Numenon. Numenon is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and much more. Tonight, we introduce the queen of cryptids. Linda Godfrey is here talking about her brand new book, I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. Her website is lindagodfrey.com. Linda, thank you so much for joining us tonight and being with us with our listeners. Always a pleasure. Absolute pleasure to have you here as well. Linda, I want to get into the book a little bit more because, you know, we talk about all of these mythical creatures of the past, Bigfoot, Dogman, gnomes, gargoyles, everything like that. When you talk about modern day encounters with monsters of new urban legend, what kind of creatures are we talking about? Well, I think the creatures, and some of them aren't really exactly creatures. I don't know. I don't know what to call them. Um, they're they're not the same as these mythical ancient types that were part man, part animal. Um, you could kind of count on them to be the same. These are more um, often made up in different ways, such as the killer clowns. Um, there's a whole group of tall, super thin, skinny, um, usually men, but, but I think sometimes women called the rake, or there's a version of the rake called Slender Man, which was um, built upon by a meme on an internet Horror, horror, I always have trouble with this word, horror um, site where people, uh, aspiring horror writers, will each contribute and make their own versions of it until it becomes this almost tangible personality. And these are just, they're very different um, from the olden days because you can count on, if you if you read about a Greek centaur um, in the... Uh, you know, ancient writers' books, you can pretty much count on, if you see one, um, as some people did by the St. Louis Arch a few years ago, that it's going to look very much like that first Greek centaur with, you know, part man, part horse. Whereas um, you have something like the Slender Man, and you go to look for it among ancient Greek literature, for instance, or um, the legends uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it's not really there. Nothing that looks exactly like it. I've had another um, 
thing called uh, shadow wolves that I've mentioned in a previous book, but that I seem to be getting more and more reports on, where it's a very huge size looking wolf. People will normally see them near a woods, and it's standing um, just outside the woods or just inside it and then walks out, and they'll say it looked like, you know, two horses put together. That was the size of it. And then it normally has red glowing eyes, which is not the sign of a regular dog man. Um, Bigfoots are usually reported to have red eyes. Bears have them. But these shadow wolves have uh, very, very pinpoint glowing ones. And people will say, I was watching it, wondering what it could be, and all of a sudden it turned sideways, and then it was like a two-dimensional thing. It all but disappeared. There was just this kind of a thin line showing where it had been. This happened to a whole family in Tennessee. I think it was in my last book, uh, Monsters Among Us, where um, they were all out. Some were gardening. Some were, you know, so little kids were playing. And this thing came walking out of the woods, and they all saw it. And it just uh, ambled through a corn patch that they had. And I think the grandmother grabbed um, a shovel or something. She was the brave one and kind of ran at it, and it just went back into the woods. But I talked with two different family members, and they both agreed on it. They said they were terrified. They hadn't seen it since. But it looked like a shadow wolf, a shadow of a big, giant wolf. That's interesting. I think that would creep me out, knowing that I'm in wolf territory here. That would freak me right out in regards to that. When you are dealing with a lot of these new cryptid-type creatures that people are, are claiming they are encountering, whether it's the rake, slender man, shadow wolves, or anything along those lines, how do you even go about finding the research? Because the Internet can be so unpredictable with that. It can, you know. And again, I sort of turn back to... Uh, my Native American legendary and lore and mythology and culture stories, a lot of different things you can call it, and because it means a lot of different things to um, the, the First Nation people. And there you can finally, you, you can usually find something that correlates to what you're looking for, at least I can. Um, for instance, I found one really um, interesting cultural story about a man named Eschkeberg who saw um, some sort of a, a vehicle come down from the sky and it landed and these beautiful maidens came out of it and uh, talked to him a little bit. There was um, an interesting dance that they had to do and then they had to sing the song a special song to make the whole apparatus rise again. And they, they took Eschkeberg along and he married one of them. But I thought it was so interesting because you could just totally translate that into modern UFO stories where, and, and actually also very much like medieval fairy stories, where there's a young man, he notes um, these other people who have a very unfamiliar looking craft that they can operate through what seemed like mysterious means, um, he couldn't sing the song that would make the uh, the sound wave that would cause this craft to rise. He had to be dependent on the uh, uh, women. The, the, I hate to call them women. They, they really sounded like something else, just very female. And um, they had to depend, he had to depend on them to pilot the craft. So, and this is very old lore so it just makes you wonder hmm is there more correlation than we think it makes me wonder what about the rake what did you learn about the rake well the rake is something that um it's generally kind of a stick man sometimes it has a hat on some people call it the hat man um it's an older that one i think has been talked about in older english um, sources and again it's nothing that there was well there was one where there was a, a marine driving down the road and he saw one of them walking and they, they're generally just like if you put a bunch of sticks together and then made them able to walk that's 
what they would look like. And he saw this thing and made um, made a drawing of it. And it's hard to get a hold of these because you you can't, like you said, you you can't tell what is new that's being said about them and what is old. Um, but the Native American records do have similar stories, and it makes me wonder. Well, maybe some of these were repeated by um, by the uh, French fur traders or um, the priests who came in very early in the 1600s. Um, that that seems to me to be the main basis for these. That they've somehow kind of, we've translated from other cultures and brought them into the modern world where they don't seem to fit. And uh, if somebody does see one, they're, they're really freaked out because it doesn't sound like what everyone else has seen. And so then you've not only seen a strange creature, you've seen a, a rare strange creature. It all just gets stranger and stranger. I thought this was going to be easier to set, just to settle it all out. I was picturing, you know, each one of these legend things or sightings would be like um, a big ball of colored... Um, yarn that had been tied together and if I just unrolled the the ball of colored yarn enough these uh, different segments would present themselves and I could see what went with what and it's not like that it's like you start unrolling this ball of yarn and you find out there's um, three colors going one way and no colors of another one and then there's all these little short ones together and then it ends up being a big gloppy mess instead of a neat ball of yarn and you kind of back at the beginning and have to try and re-roll it, which may sound far out, but it's the only way I can think of to really describe what it's like to have all these research things in front of you. You know, there's the ancient American, you're looking back at the um, some Greek story, and then you're looking at um, a, an encounter some people are giving you of being in a park and seeing these tall, thin figures. I had uh, one husband and wife who had seen a rake-like figure in their house, which was a Civil War era house um, that was originally built by a doctor and had had quite a few dead people in it. But um, this very thin, very black, shadow-like hat man. Uh, some people call them shadow people, too. There have been books written about just that topic in itself. And I think right under that um, title, too, if you just look up shadow people, you can find them. So... To me, they're almost more puzzling than the other kinds because we just don't know. Sometimes I wonder if people are seeing these things strongly enough and there's, there's a, or there's an imprint that is uh, people are, are seeing and kind of taking into themselves. If then that gives this type of, if it's an entity, it gives the entity perhaps more energy, strength to appear elsewhere. Some people think that they're related to um, UFOs and the men in black. The men in black, there again, you've got men in black trench coats and the black hats. They're not shadow people, but they're wearing the same outfit. I want to get to a question from Joey here in the chat room for you. And he says, Brian Regal, <clears throat> excuse me, assistant professor of the history of science, technology, and medicine at Keene University, has after extensive research, published a book about the Jersey Devil. In it, he provides details of the roots of misleading and political attacks against opponents of the time and how this legend actually got created, therefore indicating, or thereby indicating, it would be nothing more than a perpetuated folklore. Are you aware of this book, and does research like this change your mind about certain cryptids, like the Jersey Devil, and how does it affect your subsequent interactions with personal experiencers reporting to you? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I've heard of that book. I have not had time to uh, fully read it. But it, it doesn't surprise me a lot because there were some things with the Jersey Devil, um, like the, the timelines uh, going back to um, 1700, supposedly, and being born as... Uh, a literal demon type of thing to this woman. Supposedly there was a name. Um, and the the legend just sort of hops around and then shows back up in, in modern times where all of a sudden it's being seen on rooftops and it metamorphoses. The descriptions are different from the beginning to the end so that you finally end up with this uh, con kind of conglomeration. Um, 
And I, I think there are legends like that. For instance, um, I have a chapter on the dog women or ladies. There aren't a lot of them con- compared to just the uh, um, gender gender undefined, usual, upright, rock, walking, running canines. Um, the The female ones... I looked at each of them. Um, one was tied to usual teenage type, um, you know, haunted sanatorium things. Um, it was in Michigan, or excuse me, I'm sorry, it was in Pennsylvania, and supposedly, uh, you know, a group of young men saw it jump down from a stone wall alongside the road where there was a um, a hole that was supposed to have a meat lock and a meat hook hanging in it and when you start looking into that um, it turns out the sanitarium had originally been a resort and that was one of their places where they would store food there used to be a, a very heavy door on it which is gone now so then you have so you have a purpose for it um, and then the, the boys supposedly saw a dog or dog man like creature standing up on the stone wall near the meat locker that jumped down on the road near their car. That could have happened, but um, there was nothing to determine that it was a dog lady. Well, I looked at some of the other um, the other legends that there were, and one of them was um, supposed to be a very very pretty pretty looking um, dog lady in that the the bottom part of her was dog, the top part of her was this uh, lovely lady with blonde hair and mascara and everything and you know, the, the whole thing just didn't really make a lot of sense um, I think this one the, one, the pretty one was in Mobile, well if you looked on a map which I'm a big, a big uh, proponent, proponent of maps, maps just like um Almanacs, anything that you can spread out and look at. I like the online ones too, but I really like to have an atlas, an old-fashioned atlas. And I realized they they weren't all that far away, and there was enough time between them that they could. One teenage legend could have started, um, say, around Mobile, and then worked its way up to Pennsylvania, and certain parts of it um, stayed with it. Certain parts changed. So. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me at all if certain creatures are found to be legend. There's one in Wisconsin um, that is believed by people, and for the life of me, I'm not sure why, because it's extremely well documented that it was carved out of wood to lie in a sideshow tent up in the northern forests. And um, since then, there's a huge statue of it out in front of the the Chamber of Commerce of this town. It's a big, kind of a dragony looking thing. And for the carnival, it was supposed to be a, a black. It was painted black, and now it's shown as this big green, kind of dragony looking thing. In northern Wisconsin, they have a big festival built around it every year. So um, I, I don't think that, that the uh, Jersey Devil would be the only legendary creature to be found to be wholly legendary and I'm always very conscious of um, the origins and derivations of places that I'm or creatures that I'm writing about and there are other ones you know like the ones that really endure and that people are most familiar with um, like the Bigfoot um, and now I think the Dogman has crossed into that territory the giant birds, um, they're, they're in a different category than these other ones. And um, I don't know if I've totally answered the... Well, I mean, it kind of leads in. It kind of leads into Robin's question here. And Robin, I'm gonna, I'm just going to rephrase your question just a little bit. But of these lesser known creatures that you wrote in, I know what I saw. Were there any that kind of caught you off guard that maybe you had never heard of before, and you're like, "What the heck is this?" Hmm. Well, let's see. I'll almost have to think about that. Well, 
there there was one that that was true a, a few years ago um, when people started reporting this dog cat thing, and one one set of uh, sightings was in Southern California, another one was in uh, Florida, and they were supposed to look like um, a canine body with a cat more cat like head and features on it and standing and running on their hind legs. And there haven't been a lot of them. I, I mean, it's one that I reported, but I've been keeping an eye on because, you know, I don't really have big enough numbers to um, have any um, real sureness about them. But then um, when, when I opened uh, my Wall Street Journal to look at the review they had made, lo and behold... This started out with, they called it the cat fox, which is believed to be a new species of wild cat. Now, that's huge um, because foxes are not supposed to even be able to mate with, like, wolves or dogs. They're too, they're too genetically different. So to imagine that a fox, a fox hybrid with a, a cat, fox, fox-cat hybrid, um, really seems quite unusual, but this has supposedly been um, recognized on the island of Corsica in the Mediterranean, and that had been it was big enough to prey on their sheep and lambs, and then it was identified as a previously unknown species of large wild cat. Now I don't know if that's been totally scientifically verified because I just read that like two days ago and haven't had time to research it. But it's so very like very close to what these other people had reported about the dog cat. Um, I didn't think the cats could um, procreate anywhere outside of the the, the felids F E L I D S um, branch of, of uh, um, the branch of the animal tree. I'm not excuse me. This time of night, my uh, I'm, I'm not <laughs> I don't a, blame you. Occasionally, I start stumbling over my own words, but um, I was actually shocked to see that he added that in there and thought, "Wow, well, maybe I better go poke around, um, see what I can find from people in Corsica who have have any seen this." It's it's just too too soon. Linda, I'm going to get you to hold off right there because I got a ton of questions that I want to ask you from your new book. I know what I saw. And there are some real interesting encounters that people are having here. I'll tell you, I'm very interested in stick people. I don't mm-hmm. know if you mean that by rake, but I saw a stick person once. Really? My little guy. Yeah, we'll get into that and more. Linda Godfrey, the queen of cryptids, is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Gotta love the cryptid talk to kick off a brand new week on the mighty SOR. Stay tuned. More Spaced Out Radio. Hey, Spaced Out Radio listeners, it's Dave Scott. I want you to check out a great documentary I'm involved in called Beyond the Spectrum, Mossan's UFO Files. Directed by Darcy Weir, the film follows Jaime Mossan's journey for mainstream journalistic truth in ufology in Mexico. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon Prime. If you're a member, watch it free. It's worth the watch. Coming up this September 21st and 22nd, all UFO eyes will be focused on Toronto for the 4th Annual Alien Cosmic Expo. Come listen to some of the biggest names and experiencers in ufology. Travis Walton, Paul Hellyer, Richard Dolan, Paula Harris, Grant Cameron, Randy Kramer, and Spaced Out Radio's own Dave Scott. Tickets are on sale now at AlienCosmicExpo.com. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017. 
for your 20% discount today. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the research association, TESSA. Soon on the Space Star Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Space Star Radio listeners today. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. 
to SOR Space Travelers only at spacedoutradio.com. past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Reminder, if you've missed most of this show or others, you can always go to our free YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. All of our archives are there for you. Just hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on the daily news news in the SOR Newswire, so check that on out. The Queen of Cryptids is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We are talking with Linda Godfrey, and we love having Linda around here. Her latest book, I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. Always a good time to have Linda on. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's going really fast. Great show. So far, so good. In chapter one of your book, you get into a story about the Kandahar giant. What is the Kandahar giant? Well, the Kandahar giant is something that was found in this desert cave, and it's figuring sort of prominently um, in the the latest um, controversy over their over whether there really were giants on the earth, as so many legends, including the Christian Bible, tell about. And um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly if you wanted me to tell, tell about the whole uh, sure. giant, but supposedly U.S. forces... That. Well, supposedly this is a little different. U.S. forces killed a giant in Kandahar, um, was actually... Um, Marked by Snopes, um, the the ones who run down, um, give you true or false answers on any legend, or uh, especially urban legends. Um, but this one dates from 2016. It's titled, U.S. Forces Killed a Giant in Kandahar. They rated it false, and supposedly in the summer of 2016, so this is really quite recent, Several personalities and websites dedicated to discussing supernatural myths and conspiracy theories began claiming that an American Special Forces soldier serving in Kandahar, Afghanistan, was killed in 2002 by a 1,100-pound blade-wielding 12-foot-tall giant from Old Testament times before the giant himself was taken down by the military. Now, I I don't know how anything from Old Testament times would still be there. You know, that's a little strange, but... Um, the statement did not stop everyone from believing a 12-foot-high biblical Nephilim, or offspring of angelic beings and humans, was gunned down and its corpse hustled off by government officials. Um, I think that it's more likely, you know, that, I, I mean, giant parts of, of humans are actually found everywhere. And I, the Kandahar giant has the smell to me of something that was, derived in modern times from this uh, really eternal subject. And, again, this is something that um, I've, I've talked to people, historians, especially in Wisconsin, um, who actually have seen this, not a 12-foot, but um, up to a 9 or 10-foot uh, tall skeleton of some sort of Native American um, buried in mounds. Wisconsin, Southeastern Wisconsin is unique in having um, 96% of all the world's, and this sounds astounding, but it's true, 96% of the world's ancient animal-shaped effigy mounds. Effigy just means they're, they're made to look like a picture of something. They're, um, they're, they're not tall, cone-shaped mounds, although they have plenty of those, too. But these are generally flat, and, and it's like if you... Um, made a a flat-topped picture styled out of earth, usually with layers of different colors of clay and dirt within them. Um, And some of these are like 150 feet wide, and then they're usually two or three feet off of the ground. 
and there are there were literally thousands of them. Most of them got plowed over, or whatever. And some of them did contain bones of giant people. And there's a, a nice big lake in southeastern Wisconsin called Delavan Lake. The town of or city of Delavan is right outside of it. And there were some um, circus owners that bought that resort way back in the late 1800s and started digging into the mounds. And they found one. This was noted in the New York Times back then, 18, 18-something. 18 I can't remember the exact date. And they they kind of got it wrong. There there were um, different a different number of individuals in there. Than, um, than they said, but they were supposed to be um, seven to eight feet tall. They had double sets of teeth, which is a very common feature, and they have uh, they may have even had six digits. And if you, I, w- I was happened to be reading the uh, the chapter of David and Goliath in the Bible not too long ago, and I'd kind of forgotten really what it says about him. And they were. Um, he was very, very closely described, even down to how much each of his leg metal leg guards weighed, which is like 125 pounds each, and that he was nine feet tall, and that he had double teeth, and he had six digits on each hand and foot. So these things that people are digging up have been digging up um, all over the U.S., um, when unfortunately they desecrated these all of these mounds, um, they match up to biblical descriptions, and um, you can kind of you can pretty much bet that the the bi- biblical description of Goliath was true because um, a lot of, I never really understood either why why were just these two fighting? It was the way that they would settle um, a battle without having to kill everybody because the battles that were going on and on and on and on in that region of the world back then in the time of David um, were sort of decimating the male part of the population. (laughs) They were running out of guys to fight. It was so continual. And so this way each side would put up the champion and that's why it's even uh, seems more amazing that David was able to um, kill this giant. Of course, he was a he. His weapon, the it's just called a slingshot. And we think of this rubber band. Well, they didn't have rubber bands then. It was actually more the type that you put in something, whirl it around your head, and then you can have pinpoint accuracy. And it's quite a blow. And that's what he was using. But um, I'm getting off topic here. But it it seems that all of these were taken away. Now those um, there were at least two of the giant statues in that Delavan one, and the uh, two brothers who owned it took it to their house. One of them um, was killed, um, I think I think he took his own life in the garage. Then the house burned down, um, and nobody ever found out what happened to those two skeletons. Um, whenever I've tried to trace something like this down, the inevitable answer is, well, I gave it to the State Historical Society, and they took it to the Smithsonian. So supposedly, somewhere in the Smithsonian, there's a giant room full of these giant people, but I don't really understand why that's something that has to be kept from people. It doesn't seem like it would give away any um, national uh, warfare secrets or, (laughs) you know, why? why? Why are we being protected from that? Well, have you ever talked to Jody Cook about this subject? Um, oh, not about that particular subject. I haven't, no. You, you really should, because earlier this year we had him on the show where we were talking about giants, and he has actually had a couple of military people, after listening to the show, report to him, including one that was an eyewitness to two of these dogman-like creatures chopping up Taliban members right in front of them about 100 yards away. So he saw upright dog dogman? I'm he sorry. He, he, he had reports of these, of whatever these... 
yeah, whatever these creatures are with the giant swords, just like you were talking about the Kandahar giant chopping up the these Taliban soldiers. And the creatures with the swords were... They were dog-like. Dog, dog-like. Huh. Well, that that is a new one on me. But yeah, yeah. I'll have to ask him about that. Very interesting. But yeah, he, there's, he, he, there's no he doubt had a couple people. Well, really? Well, yeah. they do show up. I mean, um, proximity to military installations is something that I noticed right from the beginning, and that seems to come up more and more frequently and uh not just here but around europe too so i've got a chapter about that but um yeah that's very bone chilling literally literally bone chilling yeah definitely check talk to jody about that and mention that i mentioned it to you because you would definitely be able to get some really cool information from him including he had one gentleman email him once I believe he was Air Force, and the gentleman said specifically that you are not supposed to email me back. I will not respond. But It was very ominous, and the guy said, this is very, very real, and you have to check it out. Now, obviously, that could be a hoax-type email, but when we put the tinfoil on, we always like to think that, you know, that type of ominous email has some validity to it. So I would suggest checking that out. I want to move on to another creature here. Well, maybe not so much a creature, but this one's going to give me the heebie-jeebies. Linda, I hate clowns. I've hated clowns since I was a kid, and here you go and put some words in about killer clowns. That's just way too heavy for me. What's going on with the killer clowns in I Know What I Saw? Well, you know, clowns actually... Um, people think that they're these happy characters invented for children. And almost every culture and, and uh, country has had its own version of clowns. And they're, they're usually to perform um, kind of R-rated or X-rated in the old days, I'm saying, not usually today, um, sort of satire or they were supposed to be the only people that could sort of make fun of the king, although that didn't always go very well for a lot of them. Um, And I have also found that um, if you wonder why the big red lips that they have and the red nose and the cross things over the eyes, you know, that typical um, sort of clown look that they have. Now, this is is gross, and um, I have not been able to re-find the the, uh, place where I... I researched this, but according to this, that back in the old um, days where people gladiators are fighting in arenas, um, the the winner might right there then and there just kind of um, skin the face off of the loser, and then he put it on his face, and that's why um, there would be this big opening where the mouth was and the slits were you know over where the eyes would have gone. You can just it just fits so well. Once you understand that, the clowns have always been uh, fright- meant to be frightening, except for, um, well, I guess you could say Ronald, Ronald McDonald. A lot of people found him frightening, too. But um, generally, they were thought thought of as kids' uh, birthday party um, guests or entertainment, I should say in modern times, and that's not at all what they used to be. And again, they're not um, they're not creatures, really. And some of them were, um, you know, we, we associate with mass murderers, as a matter of fact. And I'm trying to think of the name of the, the one um, clown that was indicted for just John terrible. Wayne Gacy? Gacy, yes, yes. He was a clown, um, which meant he probably had a registered clown face. They each invent their own face, and then they're, they're registered um, in the National Clown Museum, and by, which, by the way, also used to be in Delavan, Wisconsin, the same place where I just mentioned those mounds being opened. So it's, it's amazing how these things all come together, and you find all the creepy things 
um, in the same regions, you know, just when you think you know everything about a place. And then also you have to look for popularity in, in the, the killer the killer clowns to um, titles, movie titles, like Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Um, there's all sorts of them. I could go on naming those all night. The Simpsons has Krusty the Clown, who was, you know, really an adult figure rather than a, a child's entertainment. So that's another thing that is written about in these uh, online horror memes um, where people take the killer clowns and, and make them into something. And it's just, I mean, I, I wouldn't even try to predict where some of these things will um, end up. And I, I don't really know. I'm not part of those communities, so I, I don't know if things have quieted down or if people are self-editing a little more. Um, since the Slender Man, but who would ever have thought that that children would have been reading those Slender Man stories intended for adults and then come up with their own take on it and do something horrendous? You know, you just wouldn't think that would happen, and yet it did. No, you definitely don't. You definitely don't think about that. What about somebody like Pennywise? Because, let's face it, that I mean, that, there's a pretty scary monster of a clown right there. Yes, it's of horror and fiction, but it's still a little bit weird to know that, you know, everybody... I, well, I just think, Linda, that everybody should hate clowns. That's just me. <laughs> Can't stand them. They disgust me. And, you know, why someone would want to play a clown? Well, you know, uh, there's something wrong with them. Something wrong with them. Well, and yet, I was looking up through old uh, newspaper pictures. My husband and I had a class reunion recently, and I was looking for things to put in there. And I found um, a page where I had been one of the winters, the, one of the winners of a county art contest. And we were all standing there holding our entries and I had painted a killer clown <laughs> for my entry. He, he wasn't, you know, evil dripping blood or anything like that, but it was the very typical with the little crosses over the eyes and the big red mouth. And that that was my entrant in the, the county art contest that I, I won something for. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how did I ever, you know, what made me make the killer clown picture? And I, I don't have it anymore, thank goodness. But I got a shudder just looking at it. Everybody else had like a picture of fish or a flower or something. So with these clowns, does this go back to the time where people were seeing the clowns after after the new Stephen King movie came out a couple of years ago and now there was all these people dressing up as clowns, chasing people? Is that kind of where this part of the book came through? Um, yeah, I, I think that that, um, that was definitely what I was thinking of when I entered them into the the uh, new urban legendary. I, I think that they have they have um, always been around, but not so scarily as they are now with all the with video games and the movies and everything. Um, they you can just make them so much more noticeable and frightening and frightening. There used to be limits as to what you could show in terms of gore and horror on movies and and TV and. Pretty much all of that is gone now. So, um, you know, and, and again, I think it's something that's it, that's evolving. All of these um, new meme type things from the internet are evolving their own way. And ten years from now, people will be sitting and having discussions about entirely different aspects of them. Yes, but somehow I think Linda, the clown is still going to be around. Oh. There is- they, they find out they, they've been around for a very long time. I never did like Krusty the Clown on The Simpsons. It always he always, uh, although he's funny, he's very very funny. Definitely, definitely. You know, we only got about two minutes here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour, and I just want to hit you up quickly here. Snake of the Lake. What kind of big snake and what lake are we talking about? Um. That may have been now. I can never remember which which title goes with which thing. There was a very big, um, supposedly in in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, water serpent type of thing. Um, 
somewhere between that and, and Nessie. And around the early 1900s, it was seen by so many people that people were uh, taking the train up from Chicago just to go and see this. And uh, Geneva Lake is very, very deep. It's, I think, the second deepest lake in Wisconsin. It's in southeastern Wisconsin, so it's readily accessible to Chicagoans. And it was uh, known for this this water monster that would actually chase boats. Men would run, row out to try and get a better look at it, and then it would chase them back to, to shore. A real well-known and well-thought-of um, minister saw it and, and swear that, swore that he did. And So there were lots of sightings of it that went on until about the time that outboard motors were invented. And all of a sudden... This quiet, peaceful lake that was fed by rocky underground springs um, became just this chaotic, buzzing surface. And so you can imagine that nothing like that would come and want to be in it. But the interesting part to that is that uh, Geneva Lake, when the settlers came, was almost completely surrounded by these giant animal effigy mounds. And it was legendarily an important place where the water panther battled with the thunderbird to keep balance between um, the upper worlds represented by the sky and the lower worlds represented by the earth and water. And it's just interesting, again, how everything kind of pulls around these same um, recurring themes, the... Uh, the, the mounds, we find we find burial mounds of all types all over the world where secrets are found. Um, one, of, one of the mounds, I'm sorry, which, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just going to say, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we're going to go to commercial at the top of the hour here. Linda Gonfrey, the queen of cryptids, our guest, we're going to get her to finish the story on the snakes. And one of my favorite topics, we're going to get into hidden little people as well. Elves running around the woods? That's eerie. We'll be back with Hour 3 next. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SRR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present. 
to enjoy your escape, use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Canada's largest UFO conference is ready to roll in Toronto this September 21st and 22nd at the Alien Cosmic Expo. This year is about the experience. Listen to the stories of Dave Scott, Travis Walton, Paula Harris, Grant Cameron, Ryan Stacey, Richard Dolan, Leslie Mitchell-Clark, and more. Get your tickets now at aliencosmicexpo.com. Hey fans, it's Dave Scott. Do I have something for you to check out? A great documentary about legendary Mexican investigative journalist Jaime Mossan and his search for the truth about UFOs. Beyond the spectrum, Mossan's UFO files can be found on Amazon Prime. It's free to watch if you're a member. You might even hear me in it. So check out Beyond the Spectrum only on Amazon Prime. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the research association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. 
Come get spooked at the fourth annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate everybody listening in on KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas. KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon. KZFX 93.7 FM in Ridgecrest, California. UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. And down in Noonan, Georgia, we are on WQEE 99.1 FM. On the digital side, hi to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club numenon numenon is your password use it wisely space travelers as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on spaced out radio our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including reading up on our daily sor newswire put to you you brought to you by Captain Shirk, our news director. For the final time tonight, we introduce Linda Godfrey. She is the queen of cryptids around here. Her brand new book, I highly suggest you go out and get it. It's called I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. And right before the break, we were talking about snakes in a lake. I hate snakes. Not as much as they weird me out like little people do from the First Nations legends. But snakes, Linda, big, big snakes. I'm a meal, not an appetizer. Yeah, they kind of creep most people out. Um, And the one I was talking about in Lake Geneva, actually there was another sighting by some... um, Oh well, they were young women when they reported it, but it had happened um, several years ago when they were young, young teenagers, and they lived in Lake Geneva, maybe half a mile from the the lake itself, and they were running through a meadow one day, and uh, kind of just on the edges of of town, and saw this big thing lying in the way of where they were running and they leaped over it and then they realized it was this gigantic snake several feet in diameter and very 20 feet long I think something like that sounds like those pythons that they have uh, taking over Florida right now um, but yeah the the, the interesting one um, the, the other interesting thing about that snake in Lake Geneva uh, Jenny it was called Jenny or um Jennifer, something like that, usually Jenny, um, was that this was also the last place lived in by Chief Bigfoot, right in that exact same spot where uh, Jenny was most often seen. And I think we talked about Bigfoot a little bit earlier. Chief Bigfoot was the last Potawatomi chieftain to live around Lake Geneva before the big uh, transfer happened in the tribes were all made to scatter to other places. Um, but there's, it's just kind of amazing to live side by side with the lore. It's actually not lore. A lot of it is just true history of all these things that happened and um, what these natural areas meant to the people who were um, living there at the time when they were forced to give up their homes. So it wasn't some sort of 
water moccasin or oh no it was or anything like that oh no it was bigger than that and it may have had like a bulkier body um it, the snake of the lake title actually came from one of the local newspapers that was writing about it i mean it was it was really well known um I think it was more like a plesiosaur Loch Ness type, from judging from people's descriptions. And they were comparing it in size and length to some of the uh, uh, car- passenger-carrying steamboats that were plying the lake at that time, which was pretty big for something. And it, it's uh, known that Geneva Lake is fed by springs way down at, at the bottom of it, and... Nobody knows where the water comes from in those springs. Well, maybe, maybe they do, but I, I haven't found out yet, I'm sure. But there, actually, there are tons of springs and lakes underground, other types of bodies of water that are not fully known at all. Um, I was watching one of the um, National Geographic channels the other day, and they, was, they were saying they, they have found what they think is like another ocean um, under under one of the poles, I believe. So... It's easy for me to see um, how if there are connected underground bodies of water that large creatures too big to survive in just one of those could maybe go between them. I I think the same thing about Loch Ness, and I think more and more people are coming to that same conclusion about Loch Ness, and there's been some recent, recent scientific research there lately that also says the same thing. So, um, but the Native Americans definitely believed it was there. They definitely believed that it fought with with the Thunderbird, and um, that was how their world stayed as it was. I got a couple of topics that I want to hit, and we got about sixteen minutes left here, Linda, with you. I want to talk about, as you just mentioned, Native Americans, First Nations, Indigenous people around here. A lot of them say there are little people communities that are tricksters and and they you know we may call them elves they call them little people and sometimes you have to make donations to them to get your stuff back. I had a good friend of mine up here who actually had that happen just a few months ago in his mother's house where all of her jewelry went dis- uh, went missing. And he actually had to make this little jewelry for the little people. And and all of a sudden, they went downstairs. They heard this ruckus upstairs. They go upstairs. All the little jewelry that he made were gone. And all the mom's jewelry was back. Really? Yeah. Huh. That's, that's pretty interesting. Well, you know, they're pretty ubiquitous. And um, I like to say, when, when I'm talking about little people as discussed with um, native tribes and that it's it's different than um, the little people we know of you know that are, are just smaller sized humans they're I think it, may, it might be more appropriate to call them small people to maybe disting, distinguish them but um, right now they're all usually known as little little people elves whatever and I was um, kind of intrigued to see that I had separate entries um, from Canada from people that uh, one was in Victoria, Canada yes. and it, yeah, 2017 and they were fairly fairly close to uh, time wise the, the other one was in um, Olympic National Forest Olymp- tell me about the tell me about the one in Victoria because that's British Columbia's capital on Vancouver Island, and I've been there a few times. Got tattooed there once, <laughs> and I'm very curious about this elf story from there. Yeah, um, he, you know, it was one that I had to kind of double question him, um, and I didn't satisfied myself and. He seemed really surprised that I would question his story, but he also kind of understood. And he said, I was not joking about this idea. I'm still shaken after all these years. I wouldn't prank anyone like that. It's not in my character to do that sort of thing. And um, 
he said it was about an elf encounter of what I suspect was an elf. And the date for the encounter itself was late July 2014, the last week of that month, early in the morning. He said the sun was rising. Um, I was 37 at the time, delivering newspapers near a wooded area around the local university in Victoria, B.C., Canada, located near the UVIC area. There is a wooded area that surrounds the entire campus, and I was southwest of it facing north. I was one block away on a parallel street doing the paper route and um, to, for supplementary income. He said the house, the, st- or the street that he stood on was at a higher elevation than the grounds around him, so he had a good view of a nearby street where an owl began making a ruckus. He said the owl was really squawking, making lots of noise, and I could even hear it through my headphones. When I took them off, I could have sworn the bird got louder. I was curious what was going on, so I stopped delivering to the block I was on and quickly whipped around the block to where I'd heard the noise. When I arrived, the bird was quiet. In fact, it was so silent, I slowly turned my head to the right. My field of vision, I do not want to sound flaky, but I had been told how to encounter what I saw by someone who deals with hidden occult creatures. I had been hoping for about a year to encounter something and was practicing quite frequently. So this was the end result of hard work. As my eyes became adjusted, I no longer felt alone. In fact, I felt I was looking into the trees or the earth realm. It went completely silent. It felt like I was in a big vacuum. This is known as the odd fa- Oz factor, by the way. Um, Jenny Randall's, I think, made made that turn up uh, that term um, up, and it really describes so many sightings. Um, then he documented um, several creatures by drawing them later. They had stepped up, they had stepped toward him while he was viewing these trees, and he said uh, one had a bigger leg than the other because he was stepping into my world. I wonder if I was doing that to him. He was about four feet tall, a very common little people size. Some of them were even bent sideways, like an upside down U with feet on the ground and their head pointing to the ground, very unusual, all staring at me. But the one felt like he asked me, I felt like he asked me a question, like, what were my intentions toward them? And he said that he replied, trying to let them know that he had the intention of peace, but he was very uncomfortable, um, felt that it had to stop, and uh, it did. The vacuum sound finished, and so did he, so did they. He raced home and drew the picture. Um, He said they were um, earth creatures, possibly elves, gnomes, or sprites. They were black in color and had an off-white glow around them with eyes that pulsed, sort of like strobe lighting, flashing the entire color spectrum, possibly infrared or violet, he asked. And he felt that he almost summoned them because he'd been hoping to see something like that, and he did, which doesn't usually work out that well or easily for people. So... Um, and the friend that showed him how to do that was a Huna shaman trained by elders in Hawaii. So that was that was a pretty interesting um, encounter. And he, he said, I've been poking at other realms as far back as I can remember. It's like turning a light switch on and off. So I don't know. It's it's unusual, but yet um, like nothing like nothing I've really read. I. It's, it's original if he did make it up. I think he was really telling me his, his true experience, though, whether others believe it or not. I want to quickly touch on one more. Cannibal dwarves. Oh. <laughs> this, 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 isn't, this isn't good if they're eating me because I will be a target. Yeah, that that's something that um, is prevalent in different uh, First Nation um, people's lore or uh, culture, and it's interesting because um, in some tribal areas, especially northwestern uh, U.S. and that part of Canada, um, there are supposed to be cannibal Bigfoots too. So you've got both. But the cannibal dwarf is known mostly by the Arapaho on the western plains. And they used to wreak havoc on people until one certain brave tribal hero learned how to kill them and get rid of them. 
Um, that and that's a usual um, sort of finish to many many Native American culture stories I've read. But um, Ivan T. Stan- Sanderson, and he he wrote a really um, amazing book called Abominable Abominable Snowman that got off in the path of some other things too. And he said there were small strange footprints that revealed the path of something with little man-like feet but very pointed heels. And he said they lived in the forests in the lower valleys where the climates were milder. They lived in small family groups, spoke a crude language, and they were supposed, he said literally thousands of them, are alleged to have started turning up um, along the mad river valley about 1950. And he said that the tracks clearly show five toes, not claws like you might find if they were raccoon prints or anything like that. And there isn't any real gory description of their cannibalism, just that they were known for that among neighboring people and that um, it pretty much wasn't um, tolerated, as you can imagine. I can just imagine. Linda, I want to get to a topic that is very close to home for me and for a lot of people who live near the woods or the wilderness, and that is mountain lions. They are seen all over this continent. Some of us have had very close encounters, including myself. My last one being last October, where I got growled at from my backyard. And I'm going to tell you, that's not a fun experience. Not a fun one at all. But here we are. And, you know, you're looking into this topic as well. Right. In fact, uh, my my youngest son and I are... Um, putting together a documentary film, these creatures are coming back. They once roamed all over um, North America, South America, and then, um, of course, with the European settlements, um, they weren't tolerated and were actually shot, um, poisoned, whatever people could do to get rid of them. And a small remnant were able to make it down to the Arizona area, um, where there was a small small pocket and, and some would cross down into Mexico so that they weren't all completely eliminated, although they were declared extinct in, in many places. Um, but now they're coming back. Um, probably the populations down there grew enough that um, the young males, when they're a couple years old, they have to strike off and try and find 30, 30 square miles or more where they can be king and um, sire families and and find uh, ladies. Some people think that they never left some of the areas in the Midwest, for instance. And I, about four or five years ago, I started receiving reports sent to me by a man in Hillsboro, Wisconsin. Happens to be a place where I spent many summer days because two of my grandmothers lived within that 18-mile ra- radius. I never knew anything about it, but he kind of just out of the blue thought I'd be interested and started sending me these reports. And he has well over 150 sightings in the past several years just from an 18-mile radius um, around Hillsboro. And the interesting thing is that uh, and many of these have been daylight, very close-up sightings with very responsible people, at least if not more than half of the sightings are of what may be called black panthers. That's what they're usually called. The panther is sort of a misnomer. Um, they're not. There is not supposed to be such a thing as a black mountain lion. Supposedly, those just don't occur. But people are seeing, for instance, they'll see a tan one walking around with the black one. So it's like they're um, interbreeding. They're they're together, and this is going on for quite a while. Now, it's also interesting that. There was a really weird and unknown to other places UFO sighting that happened about 1947 in that same town. Um, by On the same hills where many of the, the creature sightings would be later made. And it looked like two upright fence posts, according to the two different farmers who saw it from their own farms at different times and practically ran into each other at the newspaper offices. They got to town as quickly as they could and reported it. And they said these um, upright fence posts got 
to a certain point, and then they, in unison, and they were staying in, in perfect line. And then in unison, they both lowered down to a horizontal position and then zoomed quietly off to this large earthen protuberance known as Wild Cat Mountain. It's been called that since since uh, Native American times and went out of sight. It was like nothing these people had ever seen before. And you can get a little view of it. Um, we have a trailer of our movie, if you don't mind me telling this. You can go sure. to... Go to uh, YouTube or Facebook and search for Return to Wildcat Mountain. It gives you a little idea of what it's going to be. The trailer's only two and a half minutes, but we'll have a 55-minute film. But anyway, um, there are people who have actually been threatened in the area by um, local officials not to tell anybody what they saw. Everybody is denied, and yet there is depredation of um bull calves and other farm animals that's happening. Um, some people are worried whether they should be thinking about putting, keeping their children indoors all the time. And on the other hand, you can also see um, when you have a, all of a sudden a breeding species, there's a lot, it, it's kind of costly. So there's all sorts of controversy about it, and people still keep seeing these. Our last sighting of the black panther-like creature was in the um, backyard of a local barber who happened to be standing on his porch, saw this from, it just walked casually through his yard. He was only 20 feet away from it. He didn't pay any attention to him, just kept walking through the yard and went somewhere else. And then he saw, he found out that his next door neighbor had two sightings on his property, and they both live on the outskirts of the city of of, uh, Hillsborough. So um, there are things walking around unseen even the science articles about mountain lions call them ghost cats not because they think they're ghosts although two Native American and Native American related people that I talked to said they've been told that the tan ones are regular earthly mountain lions and the black ones are actually mystery or um, um, phantom cats so that's interesting, too. Interesting. We only have about 45 seconds left with you tonight. This show has flown on by, as it always does with you, Queen of the Cryptids, Linda Godfrey. Do me a favor. Tell everybody where they can find the book, I Know What I Saw. I Know What I Saw is available um, from all the online vendors, all your great brick-and-mortar um, vendors. If you've got a private bookstore in your town, um, please support it. Um, uh, so just just about anywhere that the books are sold, you can find that. And you can go to lindagodfrey.com, and uh, you'll find a trailer there. And stories that aren't in a lot of the books, um, other things that are happening, all that sort of stuff. Wonderful. Linda Godfrey, I consider you just a great friend and a great mentor in this type of programming and this type of research you are one of the best out there and we are so honored to have you on the show thank you so much for coming on coming up next we have the sor newswire and the thought of the dave stay tuned Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. 
Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hey, Spaced Out Radio listeners, it's Dave Scott. I want you to check out a great documentary I'm involved in called Beyond the Spectrum, Mossan's UFO Files. Directed by Darcy Weir, the film follows Jaime Mossan's journey for mainstream journalistic truth in ufology in Mexico. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon Prime. If you're a member, watch it free. It's worth the watch. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are, and what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch. Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Coming up this September 21st and 22nd, all UFO eyes will be focused on Toronto for the 4th Annual Alien Cosmic Expo. Come listen to some of the biggest names and experiencers in ufology. Travis Walton, Paul Hellyer, Richard Dolan, Paula Harris, Grant Cameron, Randy Kramer, and Spaced Out Radio's own Dave Scott. Tickets are on sale now at aliencosmicexpo.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. 
Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for sharing your night with us. Now, want to remind you, if you've missed most of this show or others, you can always go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on the news daily that Captain Shirk puts together for us. Getting to the SOR Newswire, let's hit the music. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show. Of course, you can head to our website and click on the news, which is right there on the front page, because we love bringing it to you. And that's kind of what we do around here, because we want to keep all of you informed. Let's get things going right off the bat. So, were you planning on storming Area 51? Well... Everybody knows Area 51 is a top-secret United States facility long associated with UFO activity, prompting a huge number of social media users to plan to raid the location in order to see aliens. Now, this was all supposed to be a big joke that really got blown out of proportion. Well, Facebook has now got involved. Actually, they've went and taken down the public event page that planned to raid Area 51. The Storm Area 51 event was reportedly taken down due to its community standards violations. Never mind the fact that almost 6 million people signed up that they were either going or interested in this. Heck, even Arby's said they would feed everybody for free if they showed up. But... Social media reports suggest that the event page will be recreated at reddit.com. Over 2 million people signed up for the event that was planned on September 20th with the Las Vegas-based Deja Vu Services Strip Club recently pledging to bring its dancers to the event. My goodness! Now you got to bring dollar bills with you. The U.S. military previously tried to discourage anyone to come into the area That came from Air Force spokesperson Laura McAndrews. Of course, Area 51 is a highly classified United States Air Force base in the Nevada test range that has been used to test top-secret aircraft for the United States military, prompting speculations about possible interactions with aliens. Never mind the fact of Bob Lazar, Richard Doty, David Adair, and others who said they have worked there. I mean, who wouldn't want to fly in there just one day? But either way, I'm actually kind of glad that this has happened. I don't like the fact that Facebook took it down because there is absolutely no reason, all right, to take it down. This doesn't violate any community standards whatsoever. I should know, I post a lot. Many of you post probably more than me. I think they were probably told by the U.S. government, hey, can you remove this, please? We'd really appreciate it. We don't want anybody dying on that day. And let's face it, they will shoot. They already killed a guy earlier this year who ran his car eight miles in. Shot and killed him. 
Do you really want to be on that list? Either way, you know there are going to be people showing up there on the 20th. Let's just hope that smarter minds prevail and nobody actually goes in. Never mind, there will probably be a very large police presence at the black mailbox that you turn off the highway, the ET highway, to turn onto the gravel road leading to Area 51. So if you're planning on going, my opinion, don't go. Just not worth it. A vampire's remains found 30 years ago. A vampire? Really? Apparently, it was a he, and he has been in his grave for so long that when his family dug him up to burn his heart, the organ had decomposed and was not there. Desperate to stop him from stalking them, they took his head and limbs and rearranged them on top of his ribs in the design of a skull and crossbones. He was a vampire, after all, and in rural New England in the early 1800s, this was how you dealt with him. When they were finished, they were reburied, and they put him in a stone-lined grave, replaced a wooden coffin lid on which someone had used brass tacks to form the inscription JB55 for his initials and age. Now, 200 years later, after the death of what is now the country's best-studied vampire, DNA sleuths have tracked down his probable name, John Barber. He was probably a hard-working farmer, missing his top front teeth. He was a no-neck biter, though. No, didn't like the blood. He had a broken collarbone that hadn't healed right, an arthritic knee that may have had him limping. And he had died an awful death, probably from tuberculosis, which was so bad it had scarred his ribs. The latest findings in the case that started in 1990 when his coffin was discovered in a gravel quarry in Griswold, Connecticut, are contained in a new report by, among others, experts at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System DNA Laboratory in Dover, Delaware. The report was summarized in a presentation back in July at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland, which aided the study and where the remains are held. The case is unusual because Barber may have been the country's only supposed vampire whose bones had been studied by scientists. This case has been a mystery since the 90s, Charla Mar Marshall said in an email, the Marshall is a forensic scientist with SNA International in Virginia who worked on the project. And she goes on to say, now that we have expanded technological capabilities, we wanted to revisit JB 55 to see whether or not we could solve the mystery of who he was in his latest chapter in a project that has cast light on the eerie vampire scare in New England, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, especially in the late 17 to 1800s, and its connection to the spread of tuberculosis or consumption, as it was called back on the day. Yeah, they go on to say, this was not bats flying through the night. No, this was not Bella Lugosi. This was just someone who got cast as a vampire. No blood sucked. All right. If you're a smoker or a vapor, the city of Dayton, Ohio, says you can't work for us. The city says it will no longer hire anyone who uses nicotine or tobacco. The rationale? City officials say they want to encourage a healthier workplace and environment and also save money. Kenneth Couch, the city's director of human resources, was quoted as saying, studies indicate that employees that smoke cost approximately an additional $6,000 per year in direct medical costs and lost productivity. But labor union leaders say they fear the new city policy could be a slippery slope that could lead to employees facing more scrutiny of their personal habits and private lives that have little or nothing to do with their job performance. 
Rick Oakley says, we are not thrilled about it, but we also understand where the city is coming from because the biggest part of their health care costs are from nicotine-related illnesses. Oakley's union represents about 365 police employees. Employees already working for the city won't be affected by the new policy, city officials say, but the plan also includes the elimination of designated smoking areas around the city property. Yeah. So apparently... They're taking their smoking seriously. Vaping? I guess so. You know, some of them vapes actually smell pretty good. I think they get a bad, bad rap sometimes. Bad rap. Moving on. All right. Remember about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, we told you about French inventor Frankie Zapata, who had failed on his quest to cross the English Channel on a jet-powered hoverboard? Well, he did it. Zapata took off from Saguenay, northern France, on Sunday morning, landed in St. Margaret's Bay near Dover in England. The journey took just over 20 minutes, and he goes on to say, I had the chance to land in an extraordinary place. It's beautiful. My first thought was of my family. It was huge. Thanks to my wife, who always supports me in these crazy projects, we worked very, very hard. The inventor says he tried to take pleasure in not thinking about the pain that his thighs were burning during this. Actually, if you see the photos of it, it looks pretty cool. Reminds me of, you know, the first Spider-Man the guys on that hoverboard flying around. I forget the criminal's name. It was played by Willem Dafoe. Forget that one. Hit me up on Twitter because I know Jeff will have that a snap of a finger. Zapata, a former jet ski racing champion, took to the skies in July on his flyboard air vehicle, but missed a platform mounted on a boat as he tried to land midway for refueling. The 40-year-old was uninjured in the fall into the sea, said he worked 15 to 16 hours a day to rebuild the machine. Yeah, he went on to say that he completed his journey across the channel. Zapata said that for his next challenge, he was working on a flying car and had signed contracts, but for now, he was pretty tired and wants a vacation. The inventor captured the world's imagination when he took to the skies above Paris at Bastille Day parades in July with the board that he can reach an altitude of nearly 500 feet with the potential to go much higher at a speed of 87 miles per hour. Notice he didn't hit 88 miles an hour. Well, we all know what happens at 88 miles an hour. He was safe. He kept it at 87. Moving on here. Let's move on, shall we? Let's. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has vowed this weekend to combat illegal deforestation a day after the head of the agency that measures deforestation said he was being sacked after a row over the scale of the problem in the Amazon rainforest. We are going to act effectively in the fight against illegal deforestation, the president wrote on his Facebook account, along with a video from Environment Minister Ricardo Sales, said that the government would bring in new technology to measure deforestation with greater precision. A day earlier, the head of Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, Ricardo Galvao, said he had been sacked after a row with Bolsonaro over deforestation. Apparently, it's all about climate change. Bolsonaro, a climate change skeptic, claimed the INPE's figures don't correspond to the truth and were damaging to the Institute and the country. We cannot accept sensationalism or the dis closure of inaccurate numbers that cause real damage to brazil's image yeah save the forest i don't usually say that but the amazon's kind of special egypt has started the first ever restoration work on a gold-covered sarcophagus of the famed boy pharaoh tutankhamun ahead of the country's new museum opening next year khalid el anani told The media that work on the outermost coffin, which is made of wood and gilded with gold, is expected to take at least eight months. He said that's because the state of the conservation is very fragile and it was never restored since 
1922, when British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the intact 3,000-year-old tomb and the treasures it held. The coffins remained in the tomb until July, when it was moved to the Grand Egyptian Museum, being built near the famed pyramids of Giza outside Cairo. Tutankhamun ascended to the throne at age 9, ruling until his death at age 18 or 19. And finally, cute little story here from British Columbia. To commemorate 30 years of marriage with pearls is what most people do. But instead, Larry Steiner decided to lean on complete strangers to help bring his wife, Holly, an anniversary she won't soon forget. Larry took to the streets last week in Coquitlam, British Columbia, posting signs asking you, a complete stranger, to text his wife on Friday the words, Larry loves you. Altogether, my wife Holly, he says, has put up with me for 40 years. How she has been able to do that is still a mystery. The sign read, as Larry described himself as an old school and not one to use social media, also asked people that help him spread the word about the special surprise by taking a photo of his poster and sharing it. Well, what Larry expected a few strangers to help out, maybe 40 or 50 people to take part, Holly's phone blew up with 3,000 text messages saying, Larry loves you. They're still coming through, he said. Happy belated anniversary. Larry loves you a day more now. And just the most creative text coming on in. So very, very cute way to end the night. Let's get to it. Thought of the Dave happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. What's your overall opinion of Dogman? Let's go to Twitter. Marty, starting things off. He goes, I hope he is current on his shots. Goddess Michelle. I think Dogman has replaced the werewolf. The notion that a person can transform to an animal has left our mind, leaving us with Dogman. John, what about bird person? Too much people kind there, John. All right, moving on here. Super Sleuth. Let me pause and think about it. Well, that's a terrible pun, man. Terrible pun. Part of the Dave. Not as entertaining as Spoon Man. Nope. Definitely not. Joe. Dog Man? No. Catwoman? Oh, yeah. The Deep Space Resident. I didn't think Twitter was appropriate for opinions, but you know, let's fold into an expert here. Let's ask Rob Morphy. Well, we got to bring Rob Morphy back on the show. We love him on here. Rob, my mother told me about one that walked up her uh, on her on a trail towards her and my dad in Cuba. I always thought it was a story to scare me till I read about them six years ago. So, yes, I believe. Biker Babe Jen. I don't know what the hell Dogman really is, but I'm all about doing... I'm all about letting it do its thing without bothering it, and it can't bother me. Don't want none of that. Roy, a beast that rivals Bigfoot, probably just as big and powerful, not as smart, but much more aggressive towards humans. My tinfoil hat. Michigander here. Nope, nobody even ever talks about it. Human target. As long as he isn't related to the bounty hunter, then cool. All right. I guess you meant Dwayne Chapman. Got that one. John, woof. Bruce, Dogman is a possible and dangerous outdoor hazard. I think Bigfoot Forest Community agrees. Bigfoot leave when Dogman is around. A51, he's a national treasure. Asa Wasing says it's a werewolf. Kevin. If he scratches at my door one more time at 3 a.m. wanting Arby's roast beef sandwich, he's getting the hose. Reverend Keith, he has a good beat, but you can't dance to it. Okay. Gil, is there any truth in it? Well, that's what I'm asking. Jim, 
I live nearly dead center in the Lycan Loop, so I pay very close attention to these reports. Tina, scary as anything. Serena, I was so fascinated by them, I wrote a novel featuring them with my own fictional spin, but hey, who knows? Robin, Dogman may be just a werewolf half-breed, but who knows if he comes up on property, both of us will be watching the Groovy Ghoulies. Walker, I think it's a maggot or my fignation. LOL, Dogman. Don't get it. Double Bobby, not a good boy. Not a good boy at all. Tim, flea drops won't work. Ron, way too curious. Need to learn about basic grooming and breath mints. Tim, scary and dangerous. They don't go back. They don't back away. Penman, why don't we ever hear about Dog Woman? We did tonight with Linda Godfrey. Heather gets the last word. Lucifer's minions waiting for the signal to come out from hiding an attack. As dead scary the sightings are, they don't seem to make a move. They also can manipulate your feelings. I think they're demonic. We're going to end it right there on the thought of the day. Thank you to everybody participating on Twitter and our Facebook pages. We will do it all again tomorrow. Big thanks for Captain Shirk for putting our SOR news wire together. I'm sure tomorrow she will have us updated with another grandiose style of stories to bring to your attention, which is always a very, very good time. Thank you, Captain Shirk, for making that happen. All of our news can be found at spacedoutradio.com. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everyone listening in at home, in your cars, at work, in our chat rooms on Facebook, the SOR Space Travelers Club, on Spreaker, and... Of course, you can listen to us on Revolution Radio's chat room as well, wherever you may be. Don't forget the Snarkettes on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. I know you're out there somewhere. Thank you so much for kicking off your week with us, sharing your evenings, letting us be a part of your night, because together, my friends... Make Say it with me. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a good night, everybody. 